T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff of the Falcon 9, stage 1. Pitch kick. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Stage two MVAC engine chilling in. First two M9 engines shut down. First stage Miko two. First stage engine shut down. Second stage has separated. Inertial velocity at Miko. <coughs> was approximately MVAC three, ignition confirmed 3.2 kilometers per second nominal Hi. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Chairman's Forum. Thanks for coming to Stimson on a rainy day. I'm Link Bloomfield. Um, <clears throat> maybe somewhere in the outer galaxies, uh, there's intelligent life that knows how to come into our orbit and then safely land on the surface of the Earth. But in all of human history, only one human being has ever done this without a government uh, sort of leading the way, and he's sitting next to me. So welcome, Elon Musk. Uh, thank you. It's an honor. 
uh, one of America's real pioneers and entrepreneurs. Here at Stimson, we talk a lot about policy. Uh, we talk about governments. We come from, uh, some of us are old enough to come from a 20th century mentality that governments seem to set policy. But in the 21st century, we're realizing that non-governmental actors often are out in front changing things. And uh, as we'll hear, I'm going to give a little bit of your background before we start to talk about space. Um, you've actually changed things in the way we use the internet. Uh, you're changing the game in space. Uh, you're changing the way we, uh, we use energy. And all of those are things that Washington people find themselves chasing the policy implications. And so to have an innovator entrepreneur, I think, is, fits right into the, the theme of Chairman's Forum. So again, we're honored to have you. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me. I know that you uh, made an important announcement uh, an hour ago, and I'm going to get to that. But first, let me just introduce our guest. <clears throat> Mr. Elon Musk uh, was uh, born and raised in South Africa, uh, came to Canada as a teenager, and then came to the United States, where he is a, a U.S. citizen. Uh, as a youth computer programmer, at the age of 12, created and sold the software for a space game and made a little money off of it. So, um, and then, just to quickly touch on the other innovations, uh, a company called Zip2, which created online content publishing software for news organizations. You co-founded X.com, which became PayPal, uh, secure e-commerce logic, which of course is uh, used um, everywhere now. Uh, in 2002, founded Space Exploration Technologies, known as SpaceX. You're the, not only the CEO, but the Chief Technology Officer, which is, I think, very interesting. Um, we'll talk about the line of rockets. We knew about the Falcon 1 and the Falcon 9. We're going to hear a little bit more in a moment. Um, and then in 2004, founded uh, Tesla Motors, the co-founder, cha chairman, and CEO, the electric vehicle company in California, and is also chairman of Solar City, a photovoltaic products and services company, started in 2006. So you see uh, some themes here, internet, video games, uh, e-commerce, um, energy efficiency technologies, and space. And so before we talk about the, the announcement, um, I'm curious, what was it that captured your imagination as a young person about space? What, what, what did space mean to you? Um, well, well, when I was very young, it, uh, space just seemed, like, seemed really cool. Um, but but um, it was not, I didn't expect to be involved in space um, when, I was, when I was young. But when I was in, in uh, college, um, I, I decided I wanted to be involved in things that I thought would have a significant impact on the future of humanity. And the three things that I could come up with were um, the internet, uh, uh, sustainable energy, both production and consumption, and um, uh, space exploration, but particularly uh, the extension of life beyond Earth to, to multiple planets. Um, and as it turn, turns out, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to get involved in, in, in all three of those areas. Well, that, that's quite interesting. So there's a, there's a geographic reach to your interest in space. It, right now you're involved in sort of doing contract activities, we can talk about that with, um, with the space station and whatnot. But, but you, you see a future vision. Do you think that uh, the, the United States or, or even private sector entities will be accessing uh, outer space at some point in the future? And how, how, how far are we from, from that vision? Yeah, I, I think in order to, um, well, in order for humanity to become a true space bearing civilization and ultimately uh, become a, um, a multi-planet species, I think uh, uh, we have to harness the power of free enterprise um, because otherwise it will simply be unaffordable. Um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, it, it, it's important to appreciate that there is a very fundamental cost barrier um, to um, life becoming multi-planetary. Uh, um, and if, if, I if, I, if you don't mind me exploring that, that, that issue a little bit, because um, if, if, you, if you break it down um, and, and first say, well, why is it important that life become multi-planetary? Um, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you look at the nature of importance itself and use the lens of history as a guide, um, and, and, and generally the lens of history, the, 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 the further you zoom out, um, the more the uh, the, the, the important uh, milestones remain and the less important ones uh, disappear, um, things that may seem important in the moment, um, uh, you, if, you, if you think about them, are, are, are not going to be really uh, important in the long term. 
But in, in, on, the, on the grandest scale, on the evolution of life itself, um, you can look at the major milestones and say that there's the advent of single-celled life, multicellular life, differentiation to plants and animals, uh, life going from the oceans to land, um, uh, mammals, consciousness, those are kind of the big ones. But I think also on that scale would fit uh, life becoming multiplanetary. It would be at least comparable to life going from the oceans to land. Um, and if, if, if there's uh, something that fits, that, that is important enough to arguably fit on the scale of the evolution of life itself, it's fair to say that it should be considered important um, and, and, and deserve some, some uh, small portion of our resources to accomplish. Um, and, uh, and I'm not talking about a, a huge portion, but you know, perhaps uh, we can bound, the, bound it quite easily by saying um, it should be much less than what we spend on health care, but more than what we spend on lipstick. Um, uh, and I, I'm a, you know, I like lipstick. I, <laughs> lipstick's very important. Uh, um, but uh, but um, you know, m maybe it's, a, it's sort of a 0.2 or 0.3% of our GDP, some, something like that is, is warranted. Um, and I do think it's, it, that uh, we should not delay uh, this, this, this action because um, you know, this is the first time in the four billion year history of Earth uh, that it's been possible uh, at all for, for life to um, extend beyond Earth. And, and, and uh, it's possible, just barely, uh, for, for humanity to um, create a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. Um, extraordinarily difficult, but possible. Um, and uh, it is hard to say how long that window will be open. Uh, that window could be open for a long time, or it could be open for a short time. Um, but it, but if I, I think that the, the wise thing to do is to, to to not assume it will be open for a long time and to take action to um, to, to make life multiplanetary while we can. Well, uh, people who have had a, a similar aspiration and a vision, uh, an attachment to the vision of space and and the continuum of human and and planetary evolution. Uh, have generally joined into sort of governmental efforts until this point, um, because that's where the action was. Would you, if someone were sitting uh, in this audience, a young person who's, who shares a similar aspiration, might, my, my expectation is they might think, well, can I get a job at NASA? Or can I work for the Air Force? Um, you went to business, you're a businessman, you're, you've had an MBA at Wharton I School. I actually don't have an MBA. I have, I have a dual undergraduate uh, in physics and economics. Physics and economics. <laughs> well, you, you, I think you've, uh, in, in so many ways, uh, uh, demonstrated the MBA uh, capability. And the question is, you, 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 that wouldn't appear to have been in something you would naturally do. Do you, do you think that private sector is on a par with the, pri with, with the government in their capacity to, 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 to aspire to these kind of accomplishments? Or where does the government and non-government come together? Which, which sure. one has the more, why, why, would you, why would you invest in one more than the other? Well, I, I, I think, uh, you know, um, I think it, it, it's, government plays an important role in funding things that um, have a, uh, a small amount of benefit to a large portion of the population, um, you know, sort of, uh, Basic science, um, uh, the frontiers of exploration, uh, that that kind of thing, where there's not an obvious uh, direct economic feedback loop, um, uh, but it's nonetheless an important thing to do. That's helpful to everyone, like the Hubble, for example. You know that we, we gained a, a, a lot of knowledge and understanding of the universe from from the Hubble. Um, it didn't necessarily translate to specific uh, economics for for one particular company, so it made sense that that would be funded by by the government. But if, Funded by the government just means funded by the people. Um, uh, government, by the way, has, has no money. It, 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 it only takes money from the people. <laughs> so sometimes people uh, forget that, that, that that's really what occurs. Um, so, so when there is a benefit that accrues to the people as a whole, then, then it's fair that the money should be uh, drawn from the people as a whole um, to, to match that benefit. Um, but, but, uh, but government is inherently inefficient, and so it, it makes sense to, to, to minimize the role of government and, uh, uh, such that gov government does only what it has to do and, 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 and no more. Um, I mean, there's, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, very clear examples of, of this um, in, in comparing something like East and West Germany or North, North and South Korea, or, you know, places where uh, you have essentially the same people, but uh, but two different systems of government, um, 
uh, and in East and West Germany, for example, the, the economic uh, output per, per capita was was about five five times higher mm. in in West Germany, arguably more than five times, but at least five times higher in West Germany than East. Um, uh, and, and, that, and, and, and it's not as though West Germany was particularly capitalist. Uh, I mean, they're, they're sort of a lot more socialist than we are. Um, and, uh, and yet they, they had that, that huge uh, output difference. Or, or North and South Korea is an even more stark example sure. where North Korea, uh, people undergo starvation. South Korea is incredibly prosperous. Um, and, uh, and, and so you want to always watch that, that dial, that, that uh, allocation of of resources dial and make sure that, that, that government doesn't, doesn't become too large a portion of the economy. Well, in the space sector, if we look back in the last, going back to the 60s, if you will, where NASA was in its heyday, we put a man on the moon in 1969, um, a lot of studies in Washington have talked about how the space industrial base is shrinking in the United States, how we have sort of losing our lead in space. Uh, after certain events in the 90s involving U.S. companies in China, there was a more restrictive export controls on satellites, commercial satellites, uh, which remain, I believe, um, under review uh, in the White House as they were under the previous administration, um, but, but restrictive. And so there's, a, there's an international space industry. Um, do you have a view on whether the industrial base, um, are we shrinking, is America's lead shrinking in your view, and where does, where does your activity fit into that picture? Uh, well, it's certainly true that over the past few decades, America's lead has um, uh, 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 really, uh, well, it went, it went away like 20 years ago um, and, 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 got, and re returned last year, th uh, thanks to SpaceX. Um, in, 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 in the 80s, um, uh, or, or, uh, America used to do almost all of the commercial launches. Um, and then... Uh, um, the, with, with the fall of the Soviet Union, and, and they, they actually ended up sort of in, in a lot of ways becoming more capitalist than, than we were. Um, and, uh, and then um, between Europe and Russia, to, le to a less degree, China and India, uh, they, they um, absorbed almost the entire commercial launch market. There are, there are a lot of commercial uh, satellites launched every year. More, more, there are more commercial satellites launched every year than there are U.S. government satellites um, by, by at least a factor of two or three. Um, and, and yet the United States uh, has sh share of, of that market has been um, is, is sort of negligible to, to zero. Um, but last year, the United States won more launch contracts, commercial launch contracts, than any other country, uh, due, due almost entirely to SpaceX. Um, now, the, the, there's a lead time of uh, anywhere from two to four years between when you win the contract and when you do the launch. Um, so in about sort of two to four years, we'll be doing more launches than, more commercial launches than any other country. Um, so, uh, uh, but I think that's because at, at SpaceX we're, we're really harnessing the, the power of American free enterprise, which is the most competitive system in the world, um, and, and applying kind of a mode of operation that is sort of uh, closer to, to Silicon Valley, I think, than, than sort of typical uh, government contractors. So in economic terms, who are the sort of bigger users looking forward a few years? Is it commercial use of space? Is it government and military use or scientific use? Uh, where's the market in looking forward in the near to midterm? Well, um, like I said, there, there's, there, there are actually more commercial launches even today that, than, um, than there are U.S. government launches. Um, so, uh, and, and I expect that uh, as we are able to lower the cost of access to space, which we're doing in, 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 in a very significant way, that there will be more commercial satellite business plans that, that work than, than was previously the case. So we'll see some, some market expansion occur. Um, so I, I would expect that the, the percentage of a space activity that is commercial will, will increase over time. Government will still play a very important role, uh, particularly for missions, li like I said earlier, that have uh, a small amount of be benefit to a large number of people, mm -hmm. um, but where there isn't a, a, a direct economic feedback loop. So, so government will still play a very important role, uh, also in pushing the, the frontier of exploration um, but in terms of, of market size, I, I, I would expect the uh, commercial market to uh, actually increase you know, on a percentage basis. You've just come from an announcement. Um, we knew about the Falcon 1 rocket. The Falcon 9 was just depicted in the film. Can you tell us what's coming next? Um, yeah, so, so, so the, the, the big announcement uh, we just made today was for our uh, Falcon Heavy launch vehicle, which is uh, it, it's going to be the most... Uh, 
capable vehicle of any kind um, on Earth. Um, uh, it'll put more than twice the payload capability of the, of the space shuttle into orbit. Um, and uh, uh, has twi twice the thrust of the, the, the biggest Russian rocket and the, and, the, and, the, and the biggest US rocket. So twice as big as the Russian Proton um, and uh, uh, the Boeing Lockheed Delta IV Heavy. So it's, it's really an, 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 quite an epic vehicle. In fact, it has, it'll have more payload to orbit than any rocket uh, apart from the Saturn V moon rocket. And, and what kind of a payload do you expect to be uh, launched off of this vehicle? I mean, what are, what are the potential uses? Uh, it's, it, there's, a, there's a wide range of potential uses. Uh, certainly, uh, Falcon Heavy can launch the, the, the largest uh, government and commercial satellites with, with ease. Uh, in fact, you could <coughs> arguably do two, two of the largest uh, satellites um, at a time. Is that um, conceivable technologically? Oh yeah, well we, we, we expect this to be on the launch pad at, Van, at, Van, at our launch pad at Vandenberg Air Force Base next year, and then launch probably in 2013. So uh, this is not uh, speculative or. But could you deploy two satellites with one? Launch? Oh yeah, sure, sure, absolutely, no problem. Yeah, oh. uh, we can we can do, de deploy. Well, in fact, um, we have the uh, launch contract to do the next generation Iridium constellation, uh, in which where we'll be doing doing uh, eight or nine satellites per flight. Per flight. Well, you're the chief technology officer. Um, I'm, I'm curious because I have a, a bit of a background in export controls and wish I had known a lot more about the fine details. Um, how sensitive is the information that your engineers have when they marry a bus uh, to a rocket launch, a payload to a launch vehicle? How much do they need to know about what's on the bus uh, in order to make sure that they don't destroy it or that they deploy it properly? Is it, is it highly sensitive information? Well, uh, it's, I, I think the, 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 simply providing enough information to, to know uh, how to integrate the satellite onto the rocket, I don't think that necessarily reveals anything particularly uh, proprietary. Um, however, s certain countries have a track record of absconding with intellectual property. Um, and, and, and so I, I think it's perhaps um, n not a good idea to put, uh, give, put them in close proximity to anything that's any advanced U.S. space technology. So there, there needs to be, I mean, the export control regime looks at the, the nationalities of the workers, uh, their access to certain work areas, right. their monitors often. And so um, after the space shuttle Endeavor takes its uh, mission at the end of this month, there will be no more space shuttle. Um, your company will be the cargo delivery vehicle to the, spa to the International Space Station, if yes. I'm not mistaken. You'll do 12, 12 uh, resupply missions. Yes. And so that's been somewhat privatized. Um, I mean, does the U.S., from a policy standpoint, need to worry a little bit about uh, uh, whether it has, and, uh, whether it can control its technology and still get it launched uh, reliably? Um. Well, um, I, I think I think uh, I, I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about U.S. satellites being launched on on any um, vehicles, except maybe maybe China is is a bit dodgy. Um, but but, uh, uh, but so, so uh, that, that that's really I think the, the only the only meaningful concern. Um, I, I've not really seen the Russians uh, try to. Um, uh, Still, U.S. rocket technology, um, uh, and, and actually, uh, that's because at least at least until SpaceX, th their rocket technology has been better than ours. So I'm not sure exactly what they would steal. <laughs> um, in, in fact, the um, the Boeing and Lockheed's uh, Atlas V vehicle uses a Russian main engine, um, and they've not yet figured out how to make that engine themselves. So, uh, th so the Russians are obviously not, not too worried about that. Um, with, with space, is, is, with the advent of, of, of SpaceX and, and, our, and our Falcon family of rockets, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's now, for, for the first time in a long time, uh, a vehicle that is better than the Russians. So uh, we, we would certainly be cautious about exposing um, our technology to the Russians, but uh, there's little danger of that. Uh, with, um, if your engineers in California can come up with a bigger and better uh, launch vehicle, are there other entities around the world who could uh, be doing the same thing and doing it within a cost 
sort of level that competes uh, as well with SpaceX and with others? Is, is, this, is this a one-off or a unique situation, or might there be a new uh, baseline, if you will, of competitive launch technologies emerging? Uh, I'm not aware of anything that uh, ha has the potential to uh, beat, what, beat our technology. Um, we're, as far as I can tell, we're, we're, we're better than anything else that exists or anything else that's under development by a significant margin. Um, there could be some secret development that I'm not aware of, um, or there could, you know, there could be some organization that starts up that's new, uh, but at least I'm not aware of anything that poses a threat to, to, to SpaceX, um, particularly given that, that our, our rate of evolution of, of our technology is, is, is very fast. Um, I mean, the, it, you know, in Silicon Valley, um, you're sort of very used to this mentality of you innovate fast or die. Um, and if you think of the, the national champions that are, or international champions that have grown out of Silicon Valley, are the Googles, Google, Facebook, Intel, Cisco, mm -hmm. Apple, um, who, who are their international competitors? Yeah. Can you name one? No. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, that's, that's, that's a different language. Than in this town, it's you innovate fast and die. <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> there's a bit of a cultural difference here. Right. You've got... Um, your operations are just outside of Los Angeles. Uh, r roughly, I mean, how big is the workforce at SpaceX? Uh, we're, we're just under 1,300 people. 1,300. And where do you, where do you find uh, space-capable engineers? How do you grow a space company in America? Well, um, I, I, so I was in Silicon Valley for 10 years before moving down to L.A. to start SpaceX. And the reason I, I did it in Southern California is because uh, Southern California has the biggest concentration of space engineers in the world. Who have uh, been laid off, or who no. are moving from one thing to another? Or? It, it, SpaceX uh, it, it hires at the sort of the top two or three percent of the, the space profession. So, it, it, I think of, think of SpaceX like special, like you have regular army, and then there's like the special forces. Special uh, space, SpaceX is special forces. I see. Um, <laughs> so, so um, it's possible they would would hire someone who is laid off if they're laid off for reasons of seniority and not merit, mm. but but not otherwise. I mean, it's curious to me, it strikes uh, one as a high-risk profession. I mean, if a rocket goes awry, we've seen films of sort of Chinese launches in the past and, and others, uh, and while they make uh, fascinating viewing, they're probably highly expensive, they make insurance companies very nervous. Um, is it high risk to have a, a rocket company? I mean, do you, do you test launch things and let them blow up just to, <laughs> just to find things out? Or? No, we don't. We never intentionally blow up a rocket. Um, <laughs> or, do you, or does it all just come down to uh, one, one vehicle and, and it's supposed to work and hope it does? We, we always aim for success. And um, we, we've uh, been fortunate in that, that, that our, our last four missions mm -hmm. have been four, four consecutive successes. Um, and uh, particularly the last one was, was particularly complex because it was a test of our Falcon 9 launch vehicle and our Dragon spacecraft, mm -hmm. uh, which, which orbited the Earth a couple times and then then um, touched down just off the coast of California, uh, which is the first time that a private company has brought the something back from orbit. Um, and uh, uh, that, 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 that's tough. There's, on, there's only sort of half a dozen uh, n nations that, that, have, that have achieved that. That's right. So. Well, that's where we began. I want to I wanted just mention the military side of space and, sure. and get sort of get your view on this. A, a lot of work is done in the Pentagon, in, in the Congress, in the executive branch. Um, and there's been doctrinal development that says space is a domain. Uh, we have security interest in space. Our economy is tied to space. Our ability to conduct military operations is integrally tied to space. There's no going back. Um, and so some will say space must be defended. It must be protected. There's a lot of effort that is that it's not irreversible, but it's to prepare for contingencies in which we are threatened in space. And uh, I guess my question is, as, as a private sector space player, do you have a view on what's happening with the military reliance on space and sort of the, um, the, 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 the substantial effort that's put into it in Washington? Is that something SpaceX would potentially contribute to, the Air Force effort? Um, yeah, a a absolutely. Um, um, you know, we certainly see um, the launching of um, Air Force and NRO type satellites as an important part of uh, our future business. We don't have any Air Force NRO launch contracts yet, but um, I'm very optimistic that we will we will soon have have uh, such contracts. Um, 
and uh, they're, they're, they're just a very, very conservative organization. Um, and, uh, uh, but now that we've had uh, two successes with our Falcon 9 vehicle, and now that we've, we're coming out with Falcon Heavy, and, and Falcon Heavy, since it's, it's if, uh, Falcon Heavy is twice as powerful as anything the Air Force currently has access to, uh, it, it allows them to launch uh, bigger satellites or potentially do multiple satellites uh, on, on a single flight. Um, and then as far as civil space missions, uh, in terms of uh, sending probes to, to outer planets, um, uh, perhaps doing something like a, a Mars sample return, uh, these are really uh, enabled by, by our Falcon Heavy capability, since, since it is, it's a capability the world doesn't have yet. Um, and, and so it, and it hasn't had since Saturn V. So it's both the civil and potentially military or intelligence uh, use. Yes, it's it's exactly civil, military, and commercial. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really going to open up uh, a lot a, a world of possibilities in all of those uh, arenas. Well, uh, one of the things that military planners talk about is uh, sort of the worst case in which assets are either being degraded or denied, or in the worst case, destroyed, which can sure. obviously create debris in orbit with with very long term consequences. Um, and they talk about the ability to reconstitute a capability very quickly yeah. in, in these, these fast-moving crises. If you have a, a launch vehicle that could potentially put several assets up quickly, I mean, is that something that you would, you would look at from a SpaceX perspective? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, at, I mean, at, at, at SpaceX, I think, you know, we're, we're very supportive of national security goals as well as uh, civil space and, and, and commercial goals. Um, I, I think in terms of um, sort of anti-satellite capability, uh, you know, I think we really need to pay closer attention to, to having defense systems on, on the satellite, just basically, basically being able to dodge missiles. <laughs> you know, it's because I think you can always build, you can build ground, ground-based anti-satellite missiles a lot faster than you can launch satellites. So um, just replacing them fast is, is, is not going to really do the trick. You, re you really need to... Uh, have satellites up there that, that can effectively dodge incoming missiles. Um, well, I'm a little concerned about laser beams, which can be turned on you know, on very short notice. And yeah, but there's a solution to that too, which is to have a powerful heat shield. Um, so uh, uh, that, that, that's something that, that, that can, because um, uh, I, I agree, you need to, to deal with missiles as well as directed energy weapons. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a little harder to do the directed energy weapon uh, technology. Uh, I'm not sure it's, uh, that you know that other countries have have that yet. They, they probably will at some point in the future. Um, but it, it's it's much easier to to just have a an, a, a sat, sat a, yeah. A, yeah, some sort of kinetic interceptor. Um, uh, but like I said, I think you can um, uh, if if you, if you have um, a uh, satellite with with a, a powerful heat shield uh, that that can be a, a good defense against uh, a, a, you know sort of a laser or something like that. In fact. Our Dragon spacecraft uh, ha has a powerful heat shield for uh, for reentering, um, wh where it's got to resist tremendous heat uh, to prevent getting getting vaporized on reentry. So mm -hmm. um, that that's something we've suggested to the Defense Department that could could be interesting technology uh, in defending against uh, anti-satellite weapons. It seems like the Pentagon has, because of the decline of the U.S. space sector, which you sort of marked at a very low point, even starting 20 years ago. Um, you know, now suggests the possibility there could be more of a competitive space sector back in the United States. D is that, do you agree with that? And do you, do you think that competition can be increased uh, to, to provide solutions like more resilient satellites or to, to sort of have a technological race, if you will, to solve problems as opposed to the sole source methodology? Yeah, well, I, I think competition is always a good thing. Um, and it, now, the U.S. has actually done, uh, relatively speaking, much better in uh, in, the, in the satellite competing in terms of satellite market than than in the launch market. So the the U.S. Uh, actually does have a dominant share, uh, or at least a, a substantial share, uh, in in the commercial satellite uh, market with uh, Laurel Space Systems uh, in in Silicon Valley and uh, um, uh, Boeing Space Satellites, which used to be Hughes uh, in mm -hmm. Southern California. Um, Orbital Sciences uh, here in Virginia. Um, so, uh, so the U.S. has done, done reasonably well on the commercial satellite front, um, and it does, does uh, very well in the in, de in the defense satellite side mm -hmm. of things. Um, but I, but I think you always <coughs> need to look at this as a constantly evolving um, m market where 
uh, European, Chinese, and, and, and other satellite makers certainly um, w want to take that market share away from American companies. We've been talking about what the U.S. can do, and some of it um, uh, on a sensitive, unilateral kind of basis, but do you have a, a view as to what the future could hold in terms of international space cooperation? Because certainly the national space policy, NASA's mission, uh, are very much geared to international cooperation, peaceful cooperation in space. How does, uh, how does a private entity that specializes in launch services, so what do you see as the road ahead in terms of potential involvement with, with non-U.S. players in space? Um, do, you, do you mean in, in, in civil space missions? Uh, it's sort of like uh, science missions and that kind of thing? Or governmental, uh, even manned space missions. I mean, if, if there were a failure of a, of, a, of a national program and they saw an opportunity they could afford to use your launch service. Sure. I mean, I'm just making this up, but... Yeah, no, I, 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 think, um, uh, you know, I think SpaceX will, will um, pr probably in about three years or so be, be carrying uh, astronauts to, to the space station. Um, I mean, as, as you mentioned a moment ago, the space shuttle retires this year. Mm -hmm. SpaceX takes over from the space shuttle as far as um, the cargo transport to, to and from the space station. Uh, but um, on an interim basis, the Russian Soyuz will carry American astronauts to the space station until, until we're ready to take over. Um, but I think at that point, uh, I'd ex I think S SpaceX will take both American astronauts, uh, astronauts from other countries, um, and uh, as well as private individuals to, to uh, space. It's very interesting. I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to ask you questions, but before we turn to those questions, I hope you don't mind if I turn to energy efficiency, because yeah, you've, sure. you've, you've got a lot of people uh, driving electric vehicles and more probably more to come. Um, can I ask you sort of what your, what your view is on, on energy? And is there a purpose, a mission behind the Tesla motors, um, uh, which, which yeah. people sometimes focus on the sports car and, mm -hmm. and what fun it is, and I've driven it, and I agree it's fun, but, but is there a larger sort of view that, that you're trying to change policy and change societal behavior on energy? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the, there was, in college I thought there were sort of three areas that most affect the future of humanity, um, the internet, sustainable energy, both production and consumption, and then, and then space. Um, so uh, what, what Tesla's about is, is trying to help uh, solve the consumption of energy uh, problem. So, so, I mean, totalogically, we must uh, have sustainable uh, consumption of energy in production, because if it's unsustainable, well, <laughs> it's unsustainable. <laughs> mm -hmm. In fact, um, if, if, uh, even, if you, um, even if there were no negative uh, environmental consequences to uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, uh, and even if there were no international security consequences, let's say we owned all the oil and it had no negative impact on the environment. It's still finite, we must still find a solution or we will face economic collapse when the resources become scarce. Um, so ob obviously we must find alternatives. Um, I, uh, I believe in, in, in electric uh, transport uh, because it allows for energy to be produced in a, in a wide range of sustainable you know, means, and then, uh, and then you just charge the car. Um, you know, electricity is sort of like, like cash. I mean, it's sort of, you can generate it in multiple ways, you can spend it in multiple ways. So, um, uh, so, um, so, so le electric vehicles is something that, that is a long-term sustainable option. Um, and and it's, it is fundamentally very energy efficient to, to use electric vehicles. In fact, although uh, our Tesla Roadster is a, is a fast sports car, faster than almost, better acceleration than almost any other sports car. Um, it uses less energy per mile than a Prius. Um, in fact, the battery pack only has the equivalent of two gallons of gasoline worth of, worth of energy. Um, and, um, and even if you take power from a coal power plant, so it's entirely coal, and you take into account transmission losses um, and uh, charging losses and so forth, and say, how much CO2 did you generate per mile? It's still less than a Prius. Because <laughs> um, st stationary power plants are actually quite uh, energy efficient. Um, so, uh, uh, anyway, so, so the, the, the point of Tesla was to um, make a viable electric car that, that broke, kind of broke the paradigm of what people thought of as an electric car. Because people used to think of electric cars as these sort of 
ugly, slow-moving golf carts. Um, and, and so by making a sports car that, uh, was, was, that was aesthetically pleasing, very fast, uh, great handling, uh, long range, um, as, you know, as much range as you get from a gas tank, uh, uh, that, that really helped break people's perception of what an electric car could be. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and it had a, a powerful catalytic effect um, in that uh, uh, when General Motors, when Bob Lutz, General Motors, saw the announcement about the Tesla Roadster, uh, he took the press release, went down to his development team and said, if a small company in California can do it, so can we. And that's what generated the, the GM Volt, and in turn, the Nissan Leaf and Daimler's movement in electric vehicles. Because at the time, they, were, they used to be the, the world's largest car company. Um, so uh, when, when the world's largest car company announces they're going to go do an electric program, the others tend to follow. Um, so I think it's had a, had a good effect in that in that direction. Of course, we need to keep up the momentum. Um, and so Tesla is coming out with uh, the sort of step two, which is a mid-price, mid-volume car that's, that really shows what is possible when you um, design the whole car as a system around electric powertrain and just how much more compelling it can be than a gasoline yeah. car. I think people will be uh, quite um, pleasantly surprised by the, the Model S that's coming out next year. Um, and there's a longer term vision of a, of a a third vehicle? Yes, yes. So, the, uh, so the, the simple sort of one, th three step strategy of, of, of Tesla um, was come out with a high price card, low volume, mid price card, mid volume, low price card, high volume. Mm -hmm. um, kind of three major technology iterations and then and stepping up production volume by an order of magnitude in each case, uh, which, which is which is damn, damn fast for a small company to grow at, at, at that rate. Well, um, I, I should just say, I saw a news clip last week that uh, a major Wall Street bank s predicted that Tesla Motors will become the fourth American major automobile company after right. GM, uh, Ford, and Chrysler. So that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. I do want to ask you as a technology person about battery storage. Sure. <clears throat> because um, <clears throat> the question is, batteries can do what they can do today. Uh, how fast is the power density improving in whether the lithium chemistries are, are alternative? Um, the military is looking at, at battery-based energy efficiency uh, in both the operational theater but also in facilities. They're a big consumer of energy, as you know. Yeah. And lithium ion has, is expensive. It's lightweight, but it's expensive. And, um, and so the question is, how fast is this moving? Is it, and how fast can we expect uh, leaps and bounds in battery storage? Well, it, it's, it's moving pretty fast. I mean, it, um, uh, if you look at the Tesla Roadster, that has a 56 kilowatt hour battery pack. The Model S will have a 90 kilowatt hour battery pack mm. in about the same volume. Um, and uh, at a, with, a, with a dramatically lower cost per kilowatt hour. Um, so the, the Model S, despite being a, a, a good size sedan, that's about the, the external dimensions roughly that of a 5 Series BMW or an E-Class Mercedes, um, uh, can, can do, will, will do 300 miles of, of, of range um, on a single charge um, and, uh, versus the Roadster, which is 245 miles um, and a much smaller car. So the Model S is 50% bigger than the, uh, heavier than the, than the Roadster, and yet does more than 20% uh, greater range hmm. um, and, and costs uh, much less than the Roadster. So Can I just ask whether the tragic uh, events in Japan have impacted the supply of, of um, batteries from no. or, or we, we, global we, supply? No. We, we had about a, 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 a one week or so a supply interruption, but we had sufficient buffer inventory on hand that it did not change our, our production at all. I see. Well, with that, I, are you ready to face the, the crowd? Sure. I, I'm sure. sure there are a lot of questions. Would you please uh, identify yourself and, and state your question clearly? Thank you. Here we go. I'd like to congratulate you on receiving the Innovators Award uh, this evening. Oh, thank you. Intel uh, um, oh, I'm honored to receive it. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions, if, if I could. One uh, of the moon versus Mars in terms of a, a, a colony, mm -hmm. and also the issue of sustainability of space and space debris. What thoughts do you have about uh, avoiding the Kessler syndrome and so on? Sure. Um, well, I, I, the reason I, I, I favor Mars over the moon um, is that uh, Mars has really got the potential for a true planet-class civilization because it's a planet. 
uh, the moon is the moon is not a planet. It, the, moon, the moon is much smaller. Um, it, it has it's it's much weaker in terms of uh, natural resources. Um, it's harder for us to adapt to it because it's got a, a much lower gravity. Uh, the day-night cycle is is uh, 28 days. Um, so you really effectively have a, a fairly small habitable zone um, near the poles of, of the moon, um, and and water ice is, is is very very rare there. So I, I think I consider the moon to be kind of analogous to the Arctic. Um, so so the Arctic was very close to Europe, but it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why America isn't there. Um, so, so, the, so it's, but Mars is a real planet, and, and, and we, we can create a, a, a become a true multiplanetary civilization um, on Mars, which I don't think is realistic on, on, on the Moon. Um, and it also, when one thinks of uh, uh, preserving the future of life as we know it, uh, the Mar Mars is sufficiently far away that if something terrible happened to, to Earth, um, it, it would probably be, uh, uh, it would not, would not, would not be affected. The Moon might still be affected. Um, and um, so that, that's, that's the reason I favor Mars. In terms of orbital debris, um, I, th I think there's only, there's a certain zone, um, which is called, I'd say it's sort of the medium Earth orbit uh, uh, altitudes, where orbital debris is, um, lo long term becomes a problem. It's not a problem today, it's, but long term it becomes a problem. Um, in, in low Earth orbit, uh, the, the atmosphere is still there to a certain degree and a actually ends up being like a, a cleaning, a cleaning, it, it, it just, it, it'll, it'll sweep out orbital debris and eventually bring it back in and slow it down and re-enter and burn up. So there's not really a, a low Earth orbit debris problem. There's, and, and if you go out to geosynchronous orbit, that's just so freaking far out there that it's really, you don't have to worry about it there either. Um, so it's kind of just in that medium zone that's sort of the, Maybe 800 to a few thousand miles type of orbit that, that we need to be uh, pay attention to, um, but uh, but I do think it's something that's only really a very long term problem. It's not something we need to worry about in the short to medium term. Another question, sir. One moment. Wait for the mic. <clears throat> Bill Sweetman, Defense Technology International Magazine. Um, you talk about um, needing to continue innovating fast. Um, with SpaceX beyond uh, Falcon 9 Heavy, which is you know, an ex extension of the original architecture, um, what directions are you taking, going to take that in? Are you going to go further into reusability? Um, what do you think that the you know, space exploration needs as the next phases of innovation from SpaceX? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in reusability. Um, and that, that remains a fundamental long-term objective of SpaceX. Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, a fully reusable rocket system, I think, is the, the fun, it's a pivotal fundamental invention necessary um, to make life multiplanetary. I do not think it will occur in the absence of a fully reusable system. And, and the reason for that is, uh, if you look at the, the cost of a propellant on a Falcon 9, it's, it's maybe $150,000, maybe $200,000 at most. But the, the, the cost of the vehicle is $50 million. So, um, so, you, you, so when you've got the cost of propellant at kind of 0.3% uh, of the cost of a flight, um, then clearly there's um, a lot of efficiency, efficiencies to be had if you can use that rocket more than once. And it really, it's, it's no different than air flight. Um, you know, a, 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 a Boeing 747 costs maybe a quarter billion dollars. You'd need two of them for a round trip. Um, so why doesn't your, your air ticket cost half a billion dollars? It's because they can use that plane thousands of times. Um, so, it's, so it's incredibly fundamental to, to have a reusable system. Um, and and going, going back to the sort of create, founding of America, if, if ships had not been reusable in the days of the Mayflower, the United States would not exist. Nobody could afford the journey. Um, and, you know, they, they might have sent a few people as an exploratory thing. And, of course, since ships, ships would be expendable, you need to, to tow your return ship behind you. Uh, um, and, and um, you know, so, so 
it, so they might have said, oh, yes, it turns out there is a continent out, out there, but, but of course we can't afford to go there because it, it costs two ships every time we make the return journey. Um, uh, but, in, but in fact, sh ships can be used repeatedly, airplanes can be used repeatedly. In fact, every mode of transport can be used uh, r repeatedly. And if, and if that were not the case, we would not use that mode of transport, um, whether it's plane, train, automobile, bicycle, or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, if I, I think we I think we can establish a self-sustaining civilization on Mars for probably something like 0.3 percent of our GDP, but I don't think we're willing to spend 100 percent of our GDP on it. And that's the difference between re reusability and non-reusability. <laughs> Um, so, so it, it remains a fundamental goal of, of, of SpaceX. Um, yeah. I'm in the front row. Andrea Malay with Futron. Uh, you made some really interesting comments about some of the protective systems. You talked about the heat shields on the Dragon and so on. Can we see uh, the possibility that you would take some of that technology and some of those innovations uh, to apply um, to the spacecraft manufacturing world where there's a lot of interest both in terms of military satellites and commercial satellites in having awareness and protection on that? Is that can we see you moving in that area? Yeah, and, uh, well I think w w with our sort of Dragon Lab program, which we're, we're starting to see a, a fair bit of interest in, which is to take the Dragon spacecraft that um, w will be used for space station servicing and adapting that to uh, uh, commercial and other government applications, um, I, I, I think you'll start to see a, um, a fair bit of that happening. Um, so certainly uh, that, that's an area of interest to us. Well, Dragon is kind of like, uh, Dragon is basically a, a sophisticated satellite. Um, it's actually more sophisticated than most, most satellites, I, I'd say, you know, because it's got multiple redundant systems. It's got the ability to dock with, with another, um, you know, with dock with the space station or, or dock with anything um, and re-enter. Um, and, uh, and, and, and actually Dragon can, can be reused. We, we, were, we recovered Dragon and we we're actually able to, to fire Dragon's engines, no, no problem. Uh, the heat shield could take um, several uh, re-entry events. So even the first Dragon that we recovered in December from orbit could be flown many times. So that, that's a, it's a step in the direction of, of reusability. Questions, right. sir? <coughs> Hi, Justin Manger with Sojitz Corporation. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you're worried as the SpaceX and uh, Tesla grow. Um, you talk about innovation all the time. Google's now, some people say, having trouble innovating and want to stay young, have that startup feel. Um, do you th are you running into that problem, or do you think you will as you, as you grow? That's what we call a high-class problem. <laughs> right, it's the high-class problem. Um, I, I actually think our rate of innovation is increasing. Um, we're, we're doing more things faster. Uh, and we also have a lot more employees, so there's another question as to whether our productivity of a person is increasing. Um, and uh, I, I do think it's, it gets difficult for companies to maintain um, a high productivity per person as they grow, uh, because companies initially improve productivity per, per person due to specialization of labor, and then productivity per person tends to decline uh, as companies get beyond a certain scale uh, due to communication issues. Um, so it, we, you know, we do our best at SpaceX to minimize communication issues um, and, and have one, any, any one to any one communication not, instead of, say, chain of command communication, which is extremely inefficient. Um, so um, I, I, think, I think we're sort of, we're a little lower on productivity per person, although, we, like I said, we're, we're, tr we're trying to fix that. But, but, as, but since we have a lot more people, our total productivity and pa pace of innovation is faster than it has ever been. Sir? Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned this morning that you're thinking about taking SpaceX, pub, SpaceX public uh, toward the end of next year, possibly, but that you'd like to retain a personal controlling interest in it because of some things that you want to do. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about those personal objectives that would um, entice you to keeping the controlling interest? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's really um, w what I want SpaceX to, to keep doing is working on the technology and the te technologies necessary uh, to um, create a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. Um, and uh, 
Uh, while I do think there's, there's, there's likely to be some uh, you know, e economic payoff uh, by transporting large numbers of people and cargo to Mars, it requires a bit of long-term thinking. Um, so <laughs> that, that, that maybe uh, goes beyond the, the, the quarterly cycle of Wall, Wall Street, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, you know, and some people in Wall Street will think that's just crazy, and uh, what I should actually just do is, is milk the government and, and various commercial uh, companies and, and try to charge them the highest price as possible, which, which we will not do. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I want to make sure that I, I can ignore, um, you know, s such things, and, and which I can only do if I'm kind of the controlling shareholder. Can I just piggyback on, on that with a, a Washington question? I mean, the mood in Washington is, is a bit grim. We've got a lot on our plate. Where the, there's a lot of discussion of unaffordability. Uh, we're going week to week with yeah. continuing resolutions. And, and the, the long-term discussion is about what's going to happen to this country if we can't change the trajectory of debt. Right. No one's talking about new things to spend a lot of money on. Right. What advice or what message would you give to the Congress and the executive branch in this sort of tough time that everyone's slogging through with a very short-term focus? Uh, what, what would you say to them as someone who is really operating against a, a different vision and a different sort of time cycle? Uh, well, I think, first of all, people ought to have some, some sense of perspective and realize that things are actually really freaking great. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like... Um, the United States is actually doing, doing, doing quite well, um, and, and w we all live really great lives here, here, here in the U.S., and, and it's, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And the U.S. Uh, is still the world's largest manufacturer, and has been since it took over from, from England, uh, I don't know, 100 and some odd years ago. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the unemployment rate is decreasing. I think there's lots of reasons to be positive, actually, um, without being complacent. Uh, uh, the, the, we, we certainly need to decrease the amount of, of government spending. Um, I think that, that, that's really important. Uh, that there seems to be some movement afoot um, uh, to, to, to rein in government spending. And it, and it can't be like a little bit here around the edges. So that, that, that doesn't count. It's, there needs to be a meaningful decrease in, in government spending such that we do not have trillion dollar deficits because that's obviously unsustainable. Um, uh, I mean, and, and that's uh, the trillion dollar deficit thing, I liken to the sort of, um, it, it's like toddlers with a cupcake. You know, if, if you've seen these sort of late gratification tests um, where, where you can pr apparently you can predict uh, somebody's future success by the degree to which they can uh, engage in delayed gratification, where if you say, here's this cupcake, it's on a table. Uh, if you eat it now, uh, you, that's all you get. But if you wait 10 minutes, you can have three cupcakes. Um, and some toddlers, they just go, and they eat that cupcake, <laughs> and they, they, they basically sacrifice tomorrow for today, uh, effectively. Um, that's kind of like what uh, you know, um, Congress so often behaves like. <laughs> the, the, and, and, and to some degree, the American people are, are responsible for this, because mm -hmm. we, we want to vote people out who, who engage in such behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, y you know, r running trillion dollar plus deficits, well, that chicken is going to, I mean, that is going to come back to haunt us like there's no tomorrow. Um, we do not want to be Greece or Portugal or, or any such country. Um, so so we, 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 we must make the hard decisions of, of reigning in government spending and probably increasing the tax uh, burden uh, as well. But we need to do both. We, we can't solve it either by simply increasing taxes or by just, just cutting deficit. I mean, it's, it's the, I mean, that's like saying, you know, the sky is blue. I mean, it's, it's so freaking obvious. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and so I think... Uh, ho hopefully, we, we, we can um, Congress can uh, can can, up, can display uh, sufficient maturity and fortitude to to make the, the right decision in this regard. Um, and I, I'd applaud, for example, uh, the UK is, is is taking the appropriate austerity measures uh, and you know cutting 25 percent of spending and that, and that kind of thing. It's we got we have to do that here, um, and it's just going to get harder and harder if we don't do it do it soon because our interest burden is going to the, the, the amount of money we spend on interest is going to start getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and it's going to make that austerity uh, even worse down the road. Well, I, I must say that you know, for all of the, the debate about how to just spend less in Washington, um, we now know after an hour of conversation that there are people out there who are, are pursuing a long-range vision that points to 
um, a lot of interesting and, and more sustainable and brighter vistas. And so I, on behalf of the Stimson Center, I'd like to thank you very much for being my guest on the Chairman's Forum. It's been Absolutely. wonderful to have you. Thank you, Mr. Moskowitz. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you.